For those of you who are joining us from across the world, wishing you all a blessed Easter, filled with love and compassion in these very difficult times. JLF's Brave New World welcomes you back to our second episode today. On behalf of our festival directors, Navita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, welcome. Our first session today was Footprints, Tracking the Plight of Migrant Workers. Uh, Chinmay Tumbe and journalist author Sabah Nakhvi joined us in a fascinating deep dive to track the plight of migrant communities, citizens of India, and discuss the disruptions to labor markets and livelihoods. In case you missed it, you can watch it and our earlier episodes on our Facebook page, JLF Litfest, or on YouTube channel, JPR Litfest. This session, we have The Boundary. Chumpa Lahiri in conversation with Jiki Sarkar. Chumpa Lahiri, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and one of the Indian diaspora's best-known writers, talks polylingual literature in a time of pandemics alongside publisher Jiki Sarkar. Chumpa Lahiri is a Penguin author of four works of fiction, Interpreter of Maladies, The Namesake, which was adapted into a feature film by Meera Nair, Unaccustomed Earth, and more recently, The Lowland, a recipient of the Pulitzer Prize, a Penn Hemingway Award, the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2012. Jumpa Lahiri, welcome, and Jumpa joins us all the way from New York. And we hope you're safe, Jumpa, in Princeton, actually, in New Jersey. Welcome. Chiki Sarkar. You. Chiki Sarkar is co-founder and publisher at Juggernaut Books. Sarkar's company is India's first publisher to have its own app for the smartphone, which creates a reading experience for users. Juggernaut authors include Twinkle Khanna, Nobel Prize winners Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Dufflow, best-selling nutritionist Rujutu uh, Devekar, Tony Joseph, JCB Prize winner Benjamin, and of course, William Dalrymple. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember, if you wish to comment and ask questions, you may do so by typing it in the comment section. Do follow our handles, JLF Litfest, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on our coming sessions and the series. In case any of you get dropped off or have a bandwidth, you can rejoin us on YouTube channel, JPR Litfest. Bandwidth is an issue we may sometimes lose our speakers, but hang in there. We hope they will be able to log back on. Uh, thank you, Jumpa Lahiri and Chiki Sarkar. Over to both of you. Um, this is a, I'm so excited about this conversation and to have this conversation with you, Jumpa. It's been a while. And you're sitting in your library in Princeton in your study, um, and you're in Princeton because you now have another new alter ego. You're, uh, you uh, are a director of the creative writing program in Princeton. Uh, and what's that like uh, as you sit there in, in an empty campus uh, and with all the students that have now sent off home? Well, first of all, hello to everybody and thank you so much. Thank you for having me uh, and, and allowing me to feel connected um, to, to all of you, to, to the festival, uh, to feel myself somehow in, in India. Um, that is very meaningful to me uh, now more than ever. Um, it's been very intense uh, the past three weeks uh, or month, I should say, at Princeton. Um, the students were sent home uh, very abruptly. Um, I taught my last class. Um, in-person class. It's been over a month and um, the campus is completely deserted. Um, the libraries are closed, everything is closed, and, um, and, but the teaching goes on. Um, so we're, we're engaged, you know, we're engaged with our, with our semester, we're seeing it through to the end. Uh, but but none of the the rhythm has been completely shattered and suspended, right? The normal and I want to ask you, rhythms. You know, I mean, you in this new life as a as a teacher. I mean, you've always been you've been a writer now, as as you know, all through your from your twenties, if not earlier. But 
What's it like to be a teacher? What's it like to teach writing uh, to write young things? Is it something you enjoy? I, I, I try to put most of my energy into teaching reading uh, and to, to learn to read with passion because that is what made me a writer and I would never have uh, been inspired or, 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 or understood how to find my way into um, that space without having had the teachers I had who taught me how to read literature and to love it more than anything and to believe in it uh, more than anything. And, and so that's what I try to largely transmit to my students. Uh, I teach them how to read. I teach them how to read uh, carefully and, and, and passionately and to fall in love with literature, to fall in love with language and with words and with authors uh, and to have a lifelong hunger for that. Um, and, and in that sense, I feel more than ever uh, the urgency to, to, to teach my classes online and to share um, with my students um, what, what I think, why, it, why it's important to read um, Primo Levi right now, why it's important to read uh, Beckett or Dante or whomever is on the reading list for this semester. Um, and, and I think that the students are, 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 are able to understand with, with such um, sort of a painful um, relevance. You know, a, a month ago, I was teaching a class, I'm teaching a class right now on the Italian short story. And I had invited a friend of mine, uh, the Italian writer, Giorgio Van Straten, to come to class to talk about the experience of World War II and the impact of World War II on 20th century Italian writers. And when I planned the session, it was all going to be very academic. You know, it was a, it would, it was a, it, it was a topic. It was an idea. Um, now my students and I understand that what we were talking about a month ago in some sense has become uh, something we are living, you know, that, that, that sense of uh, global trauma of, of an interruption, enormous interruption of life and our ways of, of, of loss of life, of suffering, of hardship. Um, it's, it's not the same at all as um, the violence of war. It's, it's a completely different kind of emergency we are going through. Uh, but at the same time, this is going to be, this is going to mark a generation, right? It's going to mark a generation of young people. And there is no way around that. And I think literature remains the, the best way, the, the key, um, the most um, inspiring key, if you will, uh, to be able to, to understand, to decode, and to endure what is happening. And of course, the, the, the teaching uh, led you to uh, a wonderful book that you've sort of re relatively recently published, The Penguin Book of Italian Short Stories that you edited. And it came out of, of, of you introducing a bunch of these Italian stories to your students, didn't it? It did. It did. The book grew out of, uh, grew out of my teaching, grew out of my, my teaching at Princeton and my desire to um, share my, my new, relatively newborn uh, love and, 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 and curiosity and passion for, uh, for Italian literature. And talk to me a little bit about this because it's this this love that you have. I mean, it's it's extraordinary in so many ways, and we will unpack it. I mean, the one the most extraordinary thing, of course, is that you're now you you almost wholly write in Italian. Um, I, I don't think you and, and and the pieces of writing that the English speaking world are seeing are translations from the Italian into English by you. In, New Yorker short story that was out recently, for example, um, and um, so it's 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 you. I, I you also I remember in your last of essays you talked about how you really just began to only read Italian. You didn't read. You stopped reading English books. Is that still the case? You're just primarily reading in Italian and writing wholly in Italian. Um, 
pretty much. I mean, I teach, I teach in, in America and I teach uh, most of my courses in, in English, not all. Um, I teach some of my classes in, in Italian um, as well, uh, or part of my classes in Italian. Um, so it's sort of a mix. Um, but I've, I've, I've more or less uh, maintained um, a, a certain discipline. Um, right now I'm reading, you know, I, I just started reading Dracula in English. Um, but I just finished um, The Betrothed, I Promessi Sposi by Manzoni in Italian. Um, so most of my reading, I would say, you know, eight out of the 10 books I read uh, are still in Italian. And my, my creative work, shall we say, my stories, my, um, my other, um, that, 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 that writing is still ongoing in, in Italian and books are, um, um, are still, uh, I'm still conceiving uh, work in, in Italian. And, and then um, sometimes I switch off and I, write, I work, I'll write an essay or, um, or some other kind of uh, work in English. And I've also become a translator in these recent years. So I've been working out of Italian into English, translating the work of uh, Domenico Cernone, for example, uh, I've translated two of his novels, and I've also I also translated a number of the stories in the Italian uh, in the short story anthology. So that's another yet another track um, in, in this moment. And ask you what drew you to Dracula? Because when I think Chumpa Lahiri and then Dracula, they're very up, they're, they're, they seem far away from each other. What's what's drawing? It is this is totally a digression, but I was just too curious. <laughs> Um, well, I had I had never read it, and um, in fact, what drew me to to Dracula? I well, I, when I was in Rome in January, I was talking to uh, a, a good friend, the writer and publisher Chiara Valerio, and she is an enormous fan of of Dracula, and she we were she was talking about it, and she was talking about it so passionately, and I thought this is ridiculous. I have to read Dracula. Um, this is, this is a huge hole in my, in my reading, uh, life. And, um, and so there you go. That's why we read, you know, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're sort of, um, uh, we, we realize we, 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 are, we, be, we come, we become aware of absences in our, our reading life and, and we do everything we can to address them. So, and I, and it's, it's extraordinary. It's just an extraordinary book. And, it's so much about, I mean, it's so, I mean, about the boundary, right? It's about um, so many boundaries being crossed, uh, the desire to cross boundaries, um, geographical um, and, and boundaries of, of, of being, of, 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 um, of life and death. Uh, so it's a very powerful book in that regard. It's funny because I was thinking about the book. Yeah, just a couple of days, and and that, and the Coppola film. So it's sort of oddly fresh in my mind. Um, but to return to Italy, um, you you know you told me that you, in your writing life you you do it intuitively rather than sort of think things through. In a in you know it sort of things happen. And you said that um, tell us that process when you moved when you found that you were just sort of, you know, the, the, that it had shifted to Italian, that you, your, your kind of creativity and your thinking had shifted to another language. You said you were, you were writing in your journal, but it was, you were beginning to write in it, Italian and you were thinking, well, what's, what's happening? What's, tell us a bit about that, that moment when, when all of this is happening. And then biographically, let's just pull it back. You moved to Rome in 2012, is that right? Yes, yes. And you live, and you moved there, and then lived there for three years. Um, and it was around; it was those three years that proved to be that sort of great. I mean, things that happened before, and you knew Italian before, of course. But those three years turned turned to be this extraordinary turning point in your life, right? Yes, yes. So, um, in those three years, um, uh, I would say um, many surprising things happened um but uh, the, the most surprising was was this um shift into uh writing in italian um something that that happened sort of straight away and and this goes back to dracula a little bit because you know because the novel is so much 
um, you know, composed of, of diaries, right? Uh, journal entries and diaries. And in the fall at Princeton, um, either in person or virtually, we don't know yet, uh, I'm going to be teaching a course on uh, diary writing and the importance of um, sort of the value of, 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 of writing a diary and reading the diaries of other writers. Um, reading th the diaries of other writers was an enormous source of um, illumination for me as a, as a, as a sort of um, emerging writer or as a hesitant writer or a terrified writer, a person terrified to call myself a writer. I would read the diaries of other writers to understand what it meant to be a writer. Um, and, and I've kept a diary, uh, for, for decades now, um, for, for you decades. Every day in your diary? Are you okay? Not every, no, not every day, not every day. Um, but it, it has, it's, it has a place in my life. And now I have, you know, uh, literally piles of notebooks in, uh, both in my house in Princeton and in a, you know, in my study in Rome. Um, I have all these notebooks that record my, my, my time, my impressions, um, my life. And, um, and so I want to teach a class to my students about the importance of, of, of reading diaries of others, of keeping diaries, and also of the a wonderful way in which the diary mode is used narratively, right? So, so Dracula is an, ex and is, is an amazing example of a novel um, that does that. Um, so that's another motivation for me, uh, just to go back to Dracula. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, my, my Italian writing starts in my diary, right? So it's, it's the diary that, that follows me from New York onto the Queen Mary, across the Atlantic. Uh, it's that same notebook that begins in English and then one week after arriving in Rome in August of 2012, um, suddenly that day, you know, I think it was August 12th or something, um, the, the, the sentences are, are in Italian and that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the journey. And when, when, when you found yourself writing in Italian, um, did you think what's happening? Were you surprised or that's just not your style? You're like, there it is, I'm writing in Italian. Oh, no, no, I had no idea what was happening. And I was very, I was completely disoriented and, and I, I just really didn't understand. But, but I, had, I had no choice in the matter. I mean, that's, writers don't really have a choice in the matter. They, they have to do what they have to do. Uh, they have to write what they have to write. Um, it's, it's so much about the unconscious. It's an unconscious. It's so much about what is, um, what is, um, not what you can't really put into words. You know, it's, it's so much about emotions and, 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 and thoughts that you have no words for. And, and yet the words emerge, um, that's where writing comes from. You don't understand what you're going to write about, but then you begin writing and it, 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 it has coherence, right, in the writing of it, but it doesn't have coherence before that. And so, so I started writing in my diary in Italian. I didn't tell anybody. I was sort of mortified and embarrassed and, 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 um, uh, disturbed by it. I didn't know what was happening. I felt very lost. I felt very scared, but I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And, 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 and eventually I stopped and I took stock of what was going on. And I thought, well, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And, and so the, the questioning of, of it was what led me to the reflections that became that first book in Italian, in other words, to try to understand what would drive me to do this, right? But it's only after the writing that one can have any perspective, certainly not before and often not, not during, at least for me. And it's, I mean, you said something to me the other day, which I was just so struck by, you said all that, you know, when you're sitting in Princeton, you do your translation work or, um, you know, the introduction to something, kind of a review or whatever it is, but the creative work, 
uh, the poetry, the novels, the short stories all now happen when you are in your home in Rome. Uh, as if in some ways, you know, I mean, it's extraordinary. It's like your life, your mind, your psyche has bifurcated. It has this, you know, there are these two worlds completely. I mean, it's, it's, to me, that's just, you know, amazing. I mean, that, that, that you're kind of embracing this and you go through this. And, and, and you also sort of said to me that you, you're now completely immersed in literary life in Italy. You know, you're on the board of a literary magazine. Um, you write regularly in their papers. Uh, do, you, do you feel in a way that you're more involved and you're more immersed in literary life in Italy than you ever were while you were in, in, in the States? I mean, is, is there a chumpa? Is, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't mean humanly. I mean, I'm sure there is, but I just even mean uh, as the, the writer, the literary writer, because I've always, as long as I've known you, I've known you uh, as, your, as a publisher and editor, I've known you as someone who's very private, who didn't like speaking about her writing very much. You didn't like readings. You, you really, you know, once the book had come out, you wanted to step back inside. You feel much more uh, out of your shell now in Italy. Have I got that right? Um, in, in some sense, in some sense, yes. Uh, I, I mean, it's a much smaller world, right? Um, it's a smaller literary community. Um, but I, I have been, I, I, I'm, I'm astonished by how welcoming it's been. I'm astonished by uh, how much a part of that community I've been made to feel uh, in these recent years. And I think it represents the best of Italy. Uh, every country has its problems. Every country has um, its 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 um, its issues, right? And 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 its hostilities and its ways of 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 putting up walls and and not welcoming the other. Um, and Italy is not free of that. Um, in fact, there it's it's very complicated right now by by these questions and I, I look at them very carefully I think about them very deeply I think about what it means um, all, all of the questions I've been thinking about all my life about identity and belonging and and the foreigner and integrating and or not you know these are the questions that have shaped my life I'm the daughter of immigrants so I have never been free of these questions I have always been examining these questions whether in the United States, uh, sort of based on my own upbringing, or whether it's stories I've heard about from my, my parents about their lives in Kolkata and about huge migration waves and shifts and communities transforming, you know, I mean, the lowland grows out of that, grows out of listening to my father talk about that experience of what happens after partition, talking about the upheaval and the movement of people and the, and the walls that go up, right? Um, and, and, and the people who are struggling to find a place um, to live their lives uh, and to be safe. Um, all of these questions that we are now, you know, again, examining. Um, but, but to go back to Italy, yes. I mean, in spite of the, the, the issues that are happening there, uh, the crisis, the migrants, et cetera, et cetera, um, that that the, the 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 warmth of the literary community um, uh, is something I will be forever grateful for, you know. Um, and and it has renewed me. It has given me a new uh, energy. It has given me new um, grounding, right? Um, and and so I do feel that I my center of gravity in that sense has has shifted. Um, and it has been an enormous source of consolation to me, especially in this moment, um, because there's so much back and forth. And the, the writing that I've done in the past couple of weeks in, in quarantine has, has been, um, you know, um, it, it engaging with, 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 with that world. Um, I think and I, and, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to go on. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I just, and I think in some sense it's, it's enabled me, I mean, so not only the writing in another language that isn't quote unquote my language, but also participating in the cultural landscape of a, of, of a place that isn't quote unquote my place enables me to really sort of live out a sort of um, a, a posture or an attitude of, of, of insisting on being the outsider. 
right? Insisting on, on being the outsider and at the same time being, feeling very much at home. I mean, I never lose sight of that. I never lose sight that I'm coming from the outside. I've never been on the inside anywhere, right? I've never been on the inside of, of any place or any culture completely. Um, and now I think with the Italian uh, experience, I'm insisting on that. I'm insisting on the very condition that gave me so much, um, that caused so much confusion and distress as I was growing up. Right. And now in my adult life, I feel that, no, I'm actually going to embrace this. I'm going to insist on it. Yeah. So you've, in a way, made yourself a kind of immigrant. And I want to, I want to, I'm not sure I'll be able to say it right. So I'm going to keep it short, but I want to turn it like one last question. Is uh, Chiki, can you important. write? Can you write your question? I'm not able to hear you. Yes. The, the question is. Um, can you hear me now? So mm -hmm. I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, I was beginning to ramble into something a complicated question, and then our conversation is sort of times up. So I'm going to pull myself back, and maybe I'll email you the complicated question. So, but I'll ask you a simpler question to end with. I had so many questions to ask you, but anyway, but this one, I, I just think all. The people who are listening to you would like to know is that there's been a novel. The novel is in Italian. You've translated it. Uh, the English uh, translation comes out next year. Um, your first novel in Italian. You've done poetry. You've done essays. Uh, you've done short stories. This is this is the first novel, isn't it? Yes, it's a it's a it's a, it's a novel. Um, it's a it's. A, it's an experimental, for me, uh, a different kind of novel. Um, it doesn't really resemble um, anything I've written before, but at the same time, it's, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a natural consequence of everything that's come before. And the questions at the heart of this story um, are uh, in a distilled form, looking at questions of, um, of, 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 of belonging and of place, right? Those, those two questions that have been, um, that I've been examining now for, you know, across all the books. Um, and, but it's, it's, but, but it's, it's, it, it, it's a novel with a completely different sensibility um, written in another, in another language and therefore written with a, you know, in some sense with another, with, a, with another brain, right? With another, um, uh, completely different um coming out of a different completely different part of me uh because a new language gives you a new way of looking at everything um because language in some sense is is your reality right uh depending on whatever language it is um you're a, you're almost a writer and a translator at the same time in, what do you mean? Well, I, I'm a writer and I am a translator, and, and now I've become a, a translator of myself. Um, what I mean but, is, you know, there's you all through this time, you've been talking about this process where there's like it's like making a bridge between that in your mind. I mean, there is so, so you know, and when you write in Italian, the story becomes different, the voice becomes different. Um, there's it's as if uh, there's an uh, there's an English language you and an Italian you. Is that even, and even with the novel, you know, one of the things you're saying is that it's very different. I can't, I can't hear your question anymore. Um, this is a very, very good place for me to just start on the audience questions. So, okay. Jumpa, I'm not going to uh, bother my convoluted questions and just give you the audience questions. So, okay. Aditi Gore. Are you going to write a book using as a backdrop the uncertainty that is the future, given that no one has a clue about the virus? Are you going to write a coronavirus novel? <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't answer that question. Uh, the, those, the, the answer would be uh, a diplomatic maybe. Who knows? Um, um, I don't have one planned, no. Ankur Sharma asks, how do you research your own family and how hard is it to write those stories down? 
Well, um, I mean, it depends on the, on the book. Um, I mean, some of the former books have required greater, a greater degree of research, right? So with, with the Lowland, um, I, I consciously uh, conducted some research for that book and I spoke to people. I went out of my way. I felt that I had to um, have some, have a better idea from a, from a variety of sources, n- not just people in my family, um, about um, the Naxalite movement, for example. Um, something I had always known about, but, but in a very informal uh, and, and incomplete um, way. Uh, other, other stories, um, you know, it's not really research, it's just... It's just living and being with people and listening to them. So much of writing is just listening. If you, if you just listen to people and, and, and watch them carefully, you learn so much about them. And so many of my stories just come out of that. Chiki, have we lost you completely? Kritika, can we pose the rest of the questions while Chiki is not, not back with us? I think she's fallen off. Jhumpa, before Chiki left, she was asking you a question about uh, the English side of you or the Italian side of you and how do you, how do you see that uh, and do they sort of conflict when you're writing? Um, not, not really. I mean, you know, depending on what I'm writing, I'm just inside of that work and I'm just working through it. Um, I mean, I've, I've always felt like various people, you know, I've, I've never felt only one thing, even as a child. And so in some sense, constructing a new linguistic identity and literary identity isn't that strange for me because there have always been, there's always been a place for another reality inside of me because my parents were so connected to another reality. We're so connected to another world and, and in some sense um, to another language, right? Especially to another language. Um, and, 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 I, and I think about that a lot. I think a lot about my, my childhood right now in the time of this quarantine and, and the lockdown, the sort of global lockdown that we are experiencing because we are so spoiled now, right? In some sense, we're so spoiled by the ability to move around so frequently and if not to move around literally to connect um, in good ways, right? I mean, this conversation is proof of that. Um, the ability to connect, to see one another. You know, my childhood was marked by, by, by two things in my memory. It was marked by distance and by silence. I felt so keenly the distance that, 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 that was and that is between the United States and India. I felt it in my body. Uh, And even though India was not even my place, right? It wasn't where I, it was always a a, a place I would go to. It wasn't the place I had come from. But I felt that distance and I felt the silence. I felt the lack of the phone calls, the infrequency of the letters uh, that my parents would receive. Uh, The the quiet, you know, the lack of the language that they knew that, that was no longer surrounding us if, if we left the house. And, and I think that in some sense, there's an echo of that right now in the world because we, all the planes are stopped, right? Almost all the, we're all still and there's a lot of silence and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and, and at the same time, it is filled with the phones and the messages and the Zoom and the, and the WhatsApp. And, and that's been an incredible empowering thing. And thank goodness for that. Um, but I, I do realize, I mean, 
you know, I was, I was, I was happily getting on a plane every six weeks, every two months to go to Rome where I maintain another home. And, and it all feels possible and do and, and doable now. Right. But when I was a child, that was not possible. And even today for so many people in the world, that is still not possible. Right. It's not that everybody has an iPhone. It's not that everybody has Internet at home. It's not that everybody can get on a plane and, 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 and go comfortably to another place. So I think that this moment is a moment for us to think about how, how things were and how things still are. For some people, I think for for so many people, life is a, a, the you know has this um, this this reality is actually their reality. It's not a pause. It's not a parenthesis. And I th and I think perhaps one of the things that could come out of this time is that perhaps it will allow us to reflect on the conditions of so many people, um, not just three decades decades ago, but even today, even today. Mm -hmm. So, Jumpa, we have a whole slew of questions. I don't think we can take all, but I'm going to give you three and you can choose. So, uh, the first is from RM Shaw, who asked, Dear Jumpa, which author's diaries did you read? Can you please share some names? The second is from Sadia Serish Islam, who asks, Will you be introducing workshops for the non Princeton community or programs for post grad students in creative writing at the Lewis Center of Arts? And a third quick question is, Google and Dracula, who has the bigger identity crisis? By <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I'll go to ask, answer the first question. Um, yeah, I, so this is so interesting because, so right before, one of the reasons I was supposed to go to Rome in May, in March rather, a month ago, uh, not only to see my son who was studying there, but I was going to give a lecture for a creative writing school that I'm involved with in Rome called Molly Bloom. Um, and so my, my idea for the lecture was to talk about the diary. Um, and I wrote, actually wrote a diary as the lecture, right? So it, it may be one of the few um, public lectures out there in the world that's written in the form of a diary. Um, and in that lecture, slash diary, I talk about many of the diaries that influenced me. Um, one of them certainly would be Kafka's diary, right? Uh, complete uh, masterpiece uh, of, 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 of what a diary it not only is, but can be, because Kafka is always blurring the boundary between his sort of quotidian account of what's happening in his day and the world of his, his interior world, his imagination. And the two things are always intersecting in, in a very kind of almost haphazard way. And you don't understand sometimes what is being described, what is the real world that's being described and what is the interior world that's emerging and pushing up against the reality. So, so that, uh, that, that diary uh, I would recommend to everybody. Um, but, um, but no, the first diary I ever read in my life was, was of course that of Anne Frank. And, and I read that diary when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. And it was probably the, the, my first encounter with, in some sense, with, with, with tragedy, right? With, with history, with the tragedy of history. Um, and, and also the, most, the first inspiring book in my life. It was Anne Frank's diary that really, I think she... She told me, she, she, she inspired me to be a writer. I really do owe everything to, to, to the reading of that book. Um, and I was, uh, I, I, I felt that, um, I mean, she was my hero, you know, when I was a child. Um, I, I, she was my friend and I looked up to her and I cried for her. Uh, and, and, and I remember many years later, I was in my 30s and I went to her house in Amsterdam for the first time with my son who was in a little stroller at the time. And I walked through her house and at the end, there's a quote about, you know, there were quotes from her diary and one of them is how she wanted to grow up and be a writer. And, and I remember I just, I just broke down and I was crying in the middle of the whole museum in front of everybody. And I was, I couldn't, I couldn't, um, 
I, I couldn't restrain myself because I, I realized then how much she had influenced me. So she was the first diary. And then I, you know, I, I read Virginia Woolf's diaries. I read Sylvia Plath's diaries. I read uh, so many diaries. But anyway, um, and because there are so many, there are so many, um, and they're such incredible um, resources. Um, Cesare Pavese wrote amazing diaries, the Italian writer. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to connect to really the, the writer's mind and the writer's craft. Well, thank you so much, Jumpa. Sorry, Chiki, we seem to have lost you in between, so I sort of took over your no, duty so after a lot of questions. Jumpa, I acted as Peter in uh, the diary of Anne Frank. Uh, oh, wow. University, and it was really, yeah, it was. it's an extraordinary piece of work, and like you, when I went to Amsterdam, it was really a, a really touching moment. But truly, thank you so much, Jumpa, for joining us all the way from Princeton. Uh, I think from all of us to you, stay safe. We know that you know this is really a difficult state, both in America and in Italy, and of course here in India. Thank you, Chiki. Most strength to you for rolling out so many digital programs that you have been, and your own festival that you've been curating, and Thank you for coming online and connecting with us. I do hope you're going to be able to share these episodes, but uh, till we meet again, and I hope it's going to be soon, a very big thank you to both of you. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who've tuned in and hung in there, uh, please do not forget to tune in also on Wednesday, the 15th of April for our next episodes. And this is Peter Carey, A Life in Writing. Peter Carey is in conversation with Chandra Haas Chaudhary, Peter Carey, as many of you will know, is one of only five writers to win the Booker Prize twice and is frequently named as Australia's next contender for the Nobel Prize. Here he talks about his life in writing and is in conversation with Chandra Haas Chaudhary. And at nine o'clock on Wednesday, we have Piku Iyer in conversation with Miru Gokhale. At a moment of overwhelming change, the master essayist and novelist Piku Iyer takes us into the heart of stillness and changelessness in conversation with publisher Meru Gokhale. He shares the secrets of solitude and silence so essential to survive the times. Pretty much what I think Chumpa ended her conversation with distance and silence. So many more questions, Chumpa. Bengali, your other languages, your connections, but maybe we'll have you back, not just on JLF's Brave New World, but hopefully on the Jai Jaipur main stage. I hope we're back next year. Thank you, both of you. And for those of you who wish to stay on and weren't able to catch our music interlude, we leave you with a short extract from our Jaipur Literature Festival Morning Music Archives, Gunijan Sabha Morning Raga by Padmini K. Rao. Padmi, Padmini Rao is an accomplished exponent of the Kirana Gharana form of North Indian classical music. She's one of the senior most disciples of Padma Bhushan, Dr. Prabha, and trained in sitar from Pramila Tagar. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful rest of the evening or rest of the day, wherever you may be. Stay safe, stay compassionate. Remember, empathy is one way to be bring, able to bring about change. We need to see, we need to show empathy, to not just the ones who we are now confined with, but also to nature and to the world around. It really needs a healing touch. Stay safe. See you on Wednesday. Thank you both. Absolutely amazing to have you both on. Stay safe. Good night. Bye, Jumpa. Bye, Sandra. Thank you.
Before I conclude with a Meera composition in Rag Khamaj, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the Ustad Imamuddin Khan Dagar Indian Music Art and Culture Society, Dagar Archives and Gunijan Sabha, Shabana Dagarji. I would like to thank Z Jaipur Literature Festival, my accompanist Munshi Ji, Aminuddin Sahib, and above all, I would like to thank my listeners for coming this morning and walking part of my journey with me. This is my first performance in the city of Jaipur, and it's very, very special to me. Thank you so much. I will conclude with a Meera Bhajan based on Raag Mishra Khamaj. This is my own composition. I hope you will like it. Ma 
सब <laughs>